Okay, so we're recording. Welcome to the presentation. Um, my name is Makar, and I'd like to introduce our uh, organization to you today and talk a little bit about um, the, the things that we want to build and kind of the the story so far and, and the long-term plans for the Liquid Propulsion Group, a newly founded rocket club at Sacramento State. Um, okay, actually, yeah. So, so what what is uh, the Liquid Propulsion Group? Um, the Liquid Propulsion Group is a is a rocket club. Uh, that was founded on campus uh, last semester. And our purpose, uh, our purpose statement goes like this. Uh, we want to develop rocket repulsion, liquid rocket propulsion systems and uh, test hardware in order to advance the member's personal competency in design of these kinds of systems, uh, be it material design, uh, mechanical design, gas physics, uh, and, and all the disciplines that go into developing a liquid rocket engine. Um, we'd like to tell you a little bit today about our first project that we're undertaking. And the, the, the kind of in the theme of, of Sacramento State, our first rocket engine is called Stinger. Uh, here I'm just showing a, a picture of a test fire by USC. And um, we'd like to tell you about the project that we've been working on uh, ever since the, the, the lockdown, essentially. And because we hope to build, build a good relationship with the faculty at Sacramento State and um, at UC Davis as well in the future, and with many different industry advisors uh, to, to to embark on, on difficult, uh, on, on, on this difficult project. So the purpose of this project is um, to build a liquid rocket engine and test fire on a test stand. So we're doing a static fire uh, on a horizontal test stand. Uh, the first purpose of this project is to develop a knowledge base around the design of the, the rocket engine. And I kind of touched on this in the previous slide. Uh, we intend to design, manufacture, and validate all the components that are going into our system. And we'd like to safely perform a campaign of static test fires um, in order to collect uh, data. And uh, this is the picture on the slide is an example of a test fire. Um, it is, we'd like to do this in order to validate the design equations that we're using to, um, to design the rocket engine, which we'll introduce a bit later, and all the engineering models based on physical uh, data out of the test fires be, uh, in order to enable our club to build engines and uh, sounding rockets and that kind of thing in the future. And as I said earlier, uh, we'd like to share this with you today because uh, we'd like to have a good uh, interface with, with, uh, with the faculty and industry because we'd like to subject our designs and decision making to, to scrutiny and to your critical trained eye um, and just develop both as, as a university club and as, as engineers. Uh, what, what's going to happen during this presentation is I'm going to give a quick overview of the high level parameters of the rocket engine that we're designing, Stinger, and then uh, our teammates are going to present um, some of the things that, that we've been working on as different subsystems of the engine. Um, and then in the end, uh, we're going to take some, well, yeah. And then we have um, an industry advisor, Jason Brown from Intel Corporation attending today. Uh, I believe he's going to be asking us some questions as, as we go along. Um, let's Let's get started. So what is Stinger? To our left, this is a rendering of a preliminary CAD model of the engine. Uh, 
this is a bipropellant liquid rocket engine that uh, runs on kerosene and liquid oxygen. Um, it is the most important parameters of it are is its low chamber pressure uh, at approximately 150 psi or 10 atmospheres and its uh, regenerative cooling feature. This engine is designed to be our first attempt at a liquid rocket engine, and it will be a test bed for developing future engines. And we'd like to get as much data out of it as possible. The design, uh, this specific, the, the way that the design is specific uh, is, is uh, sized right now. It produces about 250 pounds, uh, pounds of thrust at a specific impulse of 230 seconds. Uh, our oxidizing fuel ratio is 2.2. This uh, can be dis this will be discussed uh, later in the presentation as well. Um, to, um, to tell us a little bit more about what the organization has been, uh, how the organization has been developing and, and the kind of process that we've uh, undertaken, I'd like to introduce Cameron. Hi, uh, my name is Cameron. I graduated from Sac State last semester. Um, I was with them when we first put together LPG in March, but since then and throughout the pandemic, we've been working on this project, drawing in um, at least 15 regular members working online. We had to create completely new workflows that ended up with Notion, which is this um, this homepage that you can see where we have a collection of like a Kanban board and a different um, and where we can actually store information. So we've spent months researching this. Um, we have models to get the appropriate geometry for the nozzles, as well as to estimate the heat transfer for the cooling jacket. So we, we've spent a lot of time and I'm quite proud of like what we've actually done to get to this point. Um, we're getting to the, the point in the design process where we kind of need to reach out to more people to bring in experience because we have a rather large repository of information now, and we have a lot of really committed people that are able to work together really well, but we're just run, coming across a couple stumbling blocks. But nah, like we, we're, we're doing pretty good. Um, I'm looking forward to actually test firing the rocket. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll be uh, talking a bit more about our specific um, about the specific design challenges that we currently face at the end of the presentation that we'd like uh, your input in. So, um, the following this segment uh, is going to be a little bit more involved, uh, but a subsystem overview that describes uh, how, our, how our system is designed, uh, what the components are, and kind of some uh, high level either some steps that have been undertaken in development or some high level uh, decisions that have been made about the system. And I All right, so hi, yeah. hi, my name is Josh and I'm a member of the engine sub team. Um, the combustion chamber is a part of a larger thrust chamber system, which you can see on the left. Um, and it also includes the injector and the expansion nozzle. Uh, the purpose of the combustion chamber is to provide enough space uh, for the propellants to properly mix and combust. This combustion produces the hot exa exhaust, which is passed through a nozzle to accelerate the flow and produce thrust. Um, the main design consideration for the combustion chamber included the chamber volume and the chamber wall material. Emmett will now give you a brief overview of the materials aspect of this design. I mean, you're muted, sorry. The main things needed for the wall material is uh, high strength, so it can withstand the pressure, good thermal conductivity, so it can transfer the heat from the combustion into the fuel, so it can cool it without melting. And it needs to be able to do that at elevated temperatures. And the higher temperature, the, um, the thicker the wall can be, which increases strength. So, the two main options for this are copper and stainless steel. Copper has really good thermal conductivity and um, it's relatively good at, um, with high temperatures. It can withstand about a max of 800 Celsius on certain alloys. Uh, but the problem with this for us right now is that it is pretty expensive to get those alloys. So right now we are leaning towards stainless steel. Uh, even though its thermal conductivity is much lower, it 
is able to withstand slightly higher temperatures and is much more cost effective and stronger at those high temperatures. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Hi, my name is Enrique, and I am a member of the chamber uh, of the chamber subsystem. Um, the cooling system is essential uh, is essential for keeping the chamber wall at a set temperature. Despite the many different cooling methods, such as uh, ablative cooling, film cooling, and <clears throat> blast uh, cooling, we have decided to design a regenerative cooling jacket. Uh, regenerative cooling jackets are mainly used on bigger engines. However, we have decided to implement this model for reusability purposes. We want to be able to perform multiple test fires on this engine. We also have an opter for this design to acquire knowledge and experience since this is one of the most used uh, cooling methods. This cooling method features a, a smooth two wall design as shown by the figure on the right. It also uses one of the two fuels, in this case kerosene, as the coolant that runs through the gap, which is which, as uh, Emmett said, uh, it absorbs the, the heat. So far, we have developed a two-dimensional steady-state program that iterates towards the necessary theoretical coolant gap thickness that satisfies the current design parameters. Thank you. Hello, so I'm Yarden Eli, or Elias. I am. Uh, I actually started the club with Macar back last fall, um, and so I'll be talking a little bit about our injector selection today. Uh, so the purpose of the injector, in and of itself, is to mix and atomize the propellants. Um, proper atomization allows mixture of the fuel and oxidizer into small droplets and promotes uh, effective combustion through the chamber. In our design process, we considered three types of injectors. Uh, traditional shower head you can see in figure white or figure one on the right, uh, coaxial and a pintle injector. The shower head, like its name suggests, uses a set of propellants, jets going through a multitude of holes on the injector face, and you can see there's about a couple hundred of them. Um, the coaxial utilizes cylindrical injection elements inserted and fastened into the injector face. The pintle injector utilizes a sleeve to allow throttling of propellant distribution into, com into the combustion chamber over a wide range without excessive reductions and in injector pressure drop. Instead of using the multitude of, multitude of fuel and oxidizer orifices and impinging streams such as used in the shower head injector, a pintle utilizes a smaller number of radial orifices while a singular annular orifice is used for axial flow. In our case, we are designing a, regenerative, a regeneratively cooled engine. So we will be using the RP1 as the axial component flowing along the outside of the pencil sleeve, and we will be feeding the locks as the radial component flowing through the pencil orifices. Figure two shows, a, uh, figure two shows an example of a pencil injector configuration where the fuel is the axial component and the oxidizer is the radial component. We selected a fixed geometry pencil injector for our rocket engine for a few reasons. The first being its ability to facilitate effective atomization without the use of hundreds of propellant orifices. Pintle injectors typically have 20 to, three, 20 to 30 radial orifices, while a singular annular orifice is used for axial flow. This is favorable when considering the manufacturing efforts needed to machine the injector plate orifices. Additionally, a fixed geometry pintle will allow us the capability to build on this design to incorporate a movable sleeve, which will enable throttling capabilities in the future. And then in our next slide, you can actually see, um, it's a little bit of a design overview of our pencil injector itself. So the red arrows simulate or uh, symbolize the liquid oxygen entering the uh, pencil itself, and it exits through the pencil tip out the sides. Um, the green arrows symbolize the uh, RP1 flowing in from the regeneratively cooled rocket engine. Um, flowing through the annular gap, and that is the small gap in between the annular plate and the pintle itself. The blue arrows show the resultant uh, flow of the fluids at the angle that they uh, hit each other. So that is essentially the point, the point where atomization occurs. So we went with a square slide or square sawed uh, oxidizer orifice um, instead of circular ones. 
we want to also utilize the orifice plate um, as a means of as a means as a means of atomization. Uh, for the pencil tip itself, we actually went with a threaded a concentric pencil element, and uh, we are mounting this to the chamber using bolts. Um, and that is that is our pencil design. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is BK and I'll be a part of the engine sub team and I'll be talking about our uh, injector sizing tool development. Um, so in order to properly size the injector components, a uh, sizing tool was developed to uh, rapidly design and test component configurations. The, this tool uses our fixed, uh, fixed design parameters such as mass flow rate and propellant densities to uh, determine the required radial oxidizer orifice area and the axial fuel orifice area required to maintain um, volumetric flow rates based on the inlet component velocities from the plumbing subsystem. Um, the equations are taken from various textbooks and peer-reviewed sources including Sutton and modern engineering textbooks. One of the strengths of this tool is that it allows us to rapidly design multiple injector configurations without having to recalculate all of the sizing requirements. Uh, the chamber to pencil ratio can be modified to adjust the outer diameter of the pencil sleeve and thus the overall size of the pencil elements. The inlet component velocity can be modified alongside the number of uh, orifices desired and the tool output the um, necessary total and individual orifice areas to maintain required flow conditions. Lastly, this tool can also produce a skip distance or the distance that the axial fuel propellant travels alongside the pencil sleeve before making contact with the oxidizer orifice as well as the total moment momentum ratio, which characterizes the resultant impingement angles of the mixed propellant after atomization. Overall, this tool will allow us to modify existing designs as well as create new models as we move forward in designing and water testing with the goal of um, producing the best possible injector for the singer. Thanks. Thank All right, moving on to the propellant storage and delivery system. In this PID image, which is plumbing and instru uh, instrumentation diagram image, we have three tanks. On the far left side, you can see our helium tank, which will pressurize the entire system. In the center, we will have our fuel tank, which is the RP1. And then on the far right side, you will see the main oxidizer tank. Now, essentially, we are through the plumbing system, we have uh, three valves so far that we are considering and the purpose of the valves is to control and uh, control the opening and closing of flow throughout the system. So the three valves would be ball valves, gate valves, and globe valves. Now they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, so for example, ball valves cannot regulate flow while gate and globe valves can. And we also have to consider how it plays in with pressure drops throughout the system. Um, another two types of valves we are including within the system for safety measures are relief valves and vent valves. Relief valves and vent valves will be placed right before the main propellant tanks. Um, as you can see within the PID, it's going to allow for uh, mechanical safeties to uh, undergo in the case that the system is not operating within nominal uh, conditions. Moving on to regulators, we're essentially deciding on a two-stage regular uh, in order to deal with our supply side pressure effects. Moving on to purge systems, we have instituted a purge system uh, which will connect directly from the helium tank all the way uh, past the main propellant tanks. And essentially the purge system will allow us to clear the lines of any combustible fluids in order to create a safe and approachable system. Thank you. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Diego Marquez and I'm part of the plumbing um, sub team and I'll be um, presenting on the plumbing um, system safety. So uh, we are working on a, with the pressurized system that can be very dangerous if the correct um, safe, safety precautions aren't taken into consideration. This is why safety was one of our highest priorities when creating um, our design for the system. 
in order to accomplish our goal of a safe system, we have mechanical safeties and electrical safeties. Um, mecha our mechanical safeties consist of a manual shutoff valve that is located on our pressurant tank and on our two pressure vessels, we have a relief valve, a vent valve, and a burst disc um, as a last line of defense um, to depressurize the system. Um, we wanted to make sure to have different types of safeties to ensure that in any situation we are able to depressurize the system to be completely safe. Um, as for the electrical safeties, we are going to be using um, electromagnetic actuators, which will be placed on all controllable valves. Um, these actuators are safe, um, reliable, and are easy to control um, from close or any distance. Um, to tell you more on the control system, here's Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm Joseph and I'm a member of the controls uh, sub team. And the purpose of the control system is to monitor everything involved with the firing of the rocket and progress the rocket into later states of firing automatically and to automatically shut down the rocket and the test stand should something go wrong. Uh, in order to accomplish this, the control system has redundant uh, sensors that taking in pressure and other various inputs and using those control or using those it calculates how or it opens and closes valves to uh, change the state of the rocket. Uh, at the same time there is a remote control that can shut down the rocket if the the person controlling it thinks something is going wrong and that the control system on board has not caught it. The controls software will be programmed in Rust and we have chosen Rust because it has a, it's a very low level language but provides high level abstractions that allow for easier reasoning about your code. And as I mentioned, there will be two parts of the control software. There will be an onboard controller and uh, a program controlled by one of us that remotely interfaces with it and has some authority. So next slide. This is a state diagram for the general uh, flow of the rocket. So each state is a state the rocket can be in and the transitions are or dictate how um, how those must be progressed through. So a handshake transition means that the onboard controller and the the user uh, somewhere else agree that it's okay to move on to the next phase. Uh, so that means the onboard controller has to calculate all the pressures or take in all the inputs and make sure that nothing's out of place and the the person hiding behind a wall 100 feet away uh, has to press a button saying yes it's okay to load the rocket now at any point during the lifetime of the rocket or uh, the user can shut it down and force an abort of the rocket just to be safe uh, so on this state diagram, everything on the center is what we hope happens. And everything above and below it is what happens if something goes wrong. The hard failure is what happens when the control software loses control, basically. So something comes disconnected, something gets shaken loose, or explodes. And in the event of a hard failure, we have to rely on the mechanical safeties implemented in the plumbing. Thank you. Thank you. So next we're going to talk about uh, our testing purpose. 
So the purpose of our test fire is to safely operate the engine and collect data to validate our design models. Um, we will be using a data acquisition system as well as instrumentation such as pressure transducers and thermal couples in order to measure inlet and outlet pressures, thermal properties, and several other metrics to quantify the performance of our rocket and the validity of our design models. Our rocket design is a requirements-driven designing, meaning that we are putting a strong focus on each individual component, meeting our requirements criteria before moving on to the next part. Our validation campaign will be undertaken to verify our experimental results against our design criteria and compare against all requirements and safety standards throughout the course of the project from design and manufacturing to test fire and analysis. Thank you. I'd like to tell, uh, tell you more about some of the safety considerations that we've undertaken. Um, a large part of our guidance comes from the Friends of Amateur Rocketry, which is an amateur organization that has been testing liquid and solid rocket engines for, for years. Um, uh, we are going to be implementing their guidance on safety factors and even going uh, above, above the minimum required safety factors for our system. Um, as, uh, as we've talked earlier, uh, our system has both mechanical depressed safety in, ter in terms of uh, relief valves and a burst disc in case of an overpressure uh, to protect ourselves from uh, boiling, liquid oxygen boiling off and creating a hazardous system. Um, for all of our pressure vessels, we intend to design to 3.0 factor of safety in pressure and to proof test it with water to 1.5. Uh, for personal, during the operation, uh, all uh, we'll be following OSHA guidelines in terms of operator safety. Uh, appropriate PPE will be used for to to mitigate hazards such as uh, high acoustic loading, so loud right rocket rocket engines, right? Um, dealing with cryogenic liquids and um, and other ways to to, pr to protect the safety safety of our operators. Um, we're developing a very strict operational procedure uh, where each member that is involved in the test fire knows exactly what they're doing, and we, we're developing strong communication procedure for that as well. Uh, we are really focused on member safety and in the testing of this rocket engine. Uh, we were, as, as Joseph pointed out, we're, we have a remote operation system where both the operator and the onboard logic has control authority over the, uh, over the system. and. Uh, tracks the envelope, performance envelope, to see if there is any anomalies and that kind of stuff. Uh, we plan to uh, we plan to test off campus because there's no realistic way to to to, to pressurize our system on campus or to test fire simply, I guess, due to the loud noise, but all the other safety concerns. Um, uh, one one good candidate place is the um, you know Friends of Amateur Rocketry test site down in the Mojave Desert. We're also looking for more options uh, that are closer yes. and um, that is to be determined so far. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for listening so far. Uh, this has been the, uh, the subsystem overview and uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about our current, current design challenges that as Cameron pointed out, we're, we're we would really like to, um, we're reaching the point where we'd like more industry input to, to really make the best decisions possible. Um, one of the things that we're facing is um, we need to, um, on the design side for the uh, cooling jacket, we need to be able to characterize the pressure drops over the irregular geometries of the cooling jacket. So fuel enters in at the bottom, comes out the top of the engine, and then it, it goes up the sides absorbing heat, so its density and temperature change as well. And it's a very thin, um, thin gap um, that we need to uh, uh, that that we need to characterize and or kind of model uh, better. Um, I'd actually like to ask Cameron to to speak about the, some of the manufacturing things that we'd like to like more input in. Yeah. So um, well, part of the problem of manufacturing is also testing. So. There, it's one thing to be able to say that we can actually put it together, but we need to be able to validate that the parts are fitting correctly. And one of the biggest problems that we're going to have is making sure that the pintel is pr properly concentric with the annular gap, because the gap itself is very, very small. It's um, like 
uh, 0.8 millimeters or something. It's not, it, it, it's, yeah. Uh, if it's off to the center, then we'll have a hot spot on one side and a cold spot on the other, and it might burn through the uh, chamber wall, which is not a good thing. So, um, which we may have to just redesign how we're uh, placing the flanges together. Um, but that's one of the problems. The other one is the precision welds for the thing. Um, if we're making it out of stainless, which is the direction we're kind of going in, um, we're going to need experience in terms of machining stainless steel, 304 or 315, and somebody that is an accomplished welder at doing uh, very small, um, thin weld or uh, welding flat on thin material. And that's not something that's uh, very easily done. Uh, so. Uh, pretty much every other part of it, I can at least come up with an idea of how we are going to manufacture it. But as far as a um, process, we also need some help as far as like where we're going to put them and put the thing together. Um, I was hoping that we could find access to a CNC machine, um, but most of the design considerations that we have so far is seeing what we could do with the machines that we have on campus. So I'm... Um, <laughs> Well, up until putting the cooling jacket over the uh, chamber and nozzle, I, I'm still not entirely sure how we're going to do that. So this, this is Jason. I think I have my mic working now. Is it working? Yes. Okay. I, I had to unplug the USB and plug it back in. Um, is this the last slide or the one? Yes, this is the last slide. OK, I think. good. Yeah. All right. So this actually probably worked out for the better, because I do have a series of questions and comments. Uh, go ahead and stay on this slide. So because uh, this was one of the first questions I had down to begin with was where do you guys need help relative to the precise welding um, glad you guys saw that because when looking at your cooling jacket design and stuff like that I'm literally thinking to myself uh, what the heck are they going to do how are they going to build this thing have they even decided how much deflection they're going to have in the thin wall yeah. uh, under the different pressures and the thrust and all this other stuff because you're going to start choking down some of the flow or whatever else. So generally, my understanding is on these regenerating, uh, sorry, the uh, the preheating type jackets, uh, they're like a, I don't want to say they're a series of tubes, but they're, they are a series of channels, be. right? Yes. Yep. And, uh, uh, and, and all that other stuff. Okay. So uh, relative to looking at your, your goals, you had thrust, you had specific impulse, but this isn't actually going to go onto a satellite. So one of your criteria is not weight. Yes. And when I when I think of when I think of a regenerative rocket, uh, what I'm thinking of is something which is uh, I'm able to get a lot more thrust because I've preheated the fuel, right? I've been able to preheat it up to a very high temperature before it goes into my, uh, you know, before it goes into the combustion chamber in the nozzle. Um, and it's a very efficient way to do it. You're able to use the wasted heat. You know, so you get a lot of uh, uh, thermal efficiency out of it uh, and weight savings. But thermal efficiency and weight savings is not one of your criteria. Yes. So what I want to ask is that you might be able to, you know, consider the idea. Uh, you might be able to simplify your rocket design. So you can test your combustion chamber shape. You can, can, you can test your, your nozzle design if you're able to preheat the fuel outside, you know, uh, outside the system. Yeah. Uh, you know, through a, you know, uh, now I'm trying to think, you know, how would you heat a pipe? Yeah. So uh, actually, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you bring this up because this was actually, this is a pretty contentious uh, design decision at the beginning. We actually didn't really want to, we thought that the, our first engine wouldn't be regenerative. We thought that we would just run a water sleeve over it. Um, as far as the, um, as far as the efficiency goes, the, um, in this specific design, because the fuel is not cryogenic, the, the difference in temperature actually contributes to, to less than 1% of thermal efficiency. Um, the re so, so although, um, so, so yeah, actually, although um, the regenerative jacket does increase the efficiency of the engine, the main reason that we want to try doing it is because we want to gain experience in regenerative cooling jackets uh, for future bigger engines, that kind of sure. thing. Okay. Um, although I, I, I definitely do see the value of doing just a heat sink engine. And um, if we, if the challenges that we face with manufacturing this, this jacket are, are too, too large, uh, we will probably revert to that. 
Yeah, because um, I, what what I see on the uh, and I don't uh, let's see I don't know exactly. See, you said chamber pressure is only 150 psi. Yeah. Um, it's it's still reasonably high, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, depending on finding somebody's craftsmanship, you know, I mean, essentially what what I hear is is you're stating that hey, we need to find somebody who can do a really good weld. Uh, it's and and now your success or failure is dependent upon how critical or how good that weld is actually going to be. Um, and, and that seems like a pretty high risk point. Uh, I mean, you, you're already calling out as a high risk point, so you're aware of it. Um, and I mean, unless you find somebody who's like, oh yeah, we can, you know, you know, laser weld this up, uh, no problem. Or I know how to, you know, I got somebody who knows how to TIG weld really good or something like this. Uh, I don't, I'd be surprised if you're going to find something that's, uh, so, yeah, I think it would actually, it might be easier to, to pivot to a design that uses the board out cha uh, channels. Uh, we've kind of assessed that that was a harder manufacturing hurdle yes. than, the, than, than doing this, because I think we're kind of considering putting for the deflection. Definitely, we're we're, we're considering putting spacers, like basically copper spacers that run run across. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. It, uh, so Makar, I mean, uh, Makar, you've got some some experience here, perhaps. I think with when we make the super thin walled uh, or super, you know, I say super thin, but when we make these uh, uh, vapor chambers, right, uh, and in electronics cooling, uh, we have the same problem. You know, we've got 200 micron thick uh, copper. And we've got spans of, uh, I don't know, 300 millimeter, 200 millimeter, 100 millimeter, stuff like yeah. this. And we got to keep a very uniform spacing. And so they do have these, these meshed weaves that you can put in between that will be behave as support structure, right? So you literally, it's like putting a, think of putting like a screen or something like that uh, down inside. So instead of having, you know, a two piece part, you'd have a three piece part. You'd have your outer wall, you'd have your inner wall. And then in between you would have this sandwich material, almost like a honeycomb um, that uh, uh, that you, you might be able to consider there. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a challenge. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, this is some. This is definitely a part of the design that we're not 100 percent on yet. And well, and and that's why I'm thinking in terms of your timeline. You haven't talked much about your timeline. Uh, you know, I assume that you're looking to have something exciting. You know, you want to see some successful flame. You want to be able to hear that thundering sound yep. of a rocket in a year. You know, before you guys graduate, uh, Cameron. I think you're probably excluded, maybe, right? <laughs> well, <he's invited. laughs> I mean, you'd like to see it, but your timeline still like to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so you know, uh, the the idea is that you want to be able to see something that's in a six month or or ten month thing, and and so I would, I would argue, I guess maybe from the project man management side of things is uh, you guys are thinking all the right things and figure out how you can make it a bit more simple so that you can, you can kind of test and verify, you know, the, uh, the maturity of each one of your steps. I mean, you've got your control systems, you've got your software, you've got your, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole pipes and the ball valves and the fittings and stuff like that. And none of these things are going to work right yeah. out of the box. Uh, you're going to be able to test, 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 test. Um, and uh, so I, I might just say, you know, and if you had a, uh, a, an existing test platform where all you were having to do was load in a rocket and test it, and you, you know, so you had this verified and validated test platform already that you could hook up to, I'd say, yeah, go for it guys. But yes. I'm thinking you've got a, you've got a lot of other headaches. You're going to, you're going to sink a lot of cost into something and you're going to be plagued with other things before, uh, before you can hear that bang. So, okay. uh, so anyway, so that's just one consideration. Yep. Thank you. Um, now <laughs> let's go back to stay there. Uh, let's go to, Slide nine. Okay, yeah, copper or stainless. Um, let's see, I've got here mainly, yeah, this was, uh, shoot, sorry, my, my sticky notes uh, fell to the ground. Yeah, okay, so this was the manufacturing question. I think we've already kind of answered that. Let's go to slide 10. We talked about pressure deflection, uh, preheat of the chamber. Okay, so we're good there. Uh, slide 11. 
okay, this thing, uh, is this going to be a make or a buy item? You going to make it or are you going to buy it? The pencil? This is, this is a make yeah. item. Although yeah. this is the, yeah, this is, the make is, is here. Yeah, this is the, uh, the actual design. Okay, so this is the make. One uh, of the driving decisions for, for the pencil over the, something like an impinging injector is that an impinging injector requires a bunch of super precise, tiny holes that are also angled mm -hmm. um, and really weird uh, manifolding. So yeah. this, the, make, the make is basically, this is a first, first kind of sketch. Uh, we're, we're still working on, on yeah. figuring out exactly what it's going to uh, be. Yeah. On that shower nozzle, one of the things for the, uh, when I was on a, uh, uh, at Aero, no, I wasn't at Aerojet, but uh, I've worked with some people at Aerojet. When they make these nozzles, um, there was one concept, I don't know how successful it was, but it was actually fairly impressive. They made it uh, with a series of plates. Um, and so they, they, they made all their holes and yep. all their, their paths and they just layered it up, right? Almost like a 3D print in a way. Uh, but I think it was stamped titanium or something like that, or machine titanium plates. And the plates were, I can't remember how thick, half millimeter, millimeter thick or something like that. Um, and then sandwiched together. Uh, but you guys are doing the pencil design, which I think probably is probably more uh, appropriate. Yeah. Uh, certainly a lot more basic. That uh, does sound like a really cool concept though. But I think uh, at cool. this point, the technology is uh, definitely around uh, powder 3D printing has matured a bit. So people are making that type of man like the reason that you need so many channels or that many yeah. plates is to make a channel people yeah. do that with uh printing now it's yeah it's, it's expensive yeah um, I've, I've, did, I've looked into it before <laughs> yeah we did actually look at the uh the stacked plates like there's yeah. a, a a russian um oh, I, it's uh it's like a it's a surface to air missile that actually uses that that in particular but it seemed like a lot more complicated than uh, turning down the actual pintle shaft. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the pintle shaft is probably the right way to go at this time. So uh, in terms of the pintle shaft design, this is where uh, I would say that, uh, let's see, the uh, tolerance analysis is going to be fairly, fairly important. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though I know you're just making one of these. Um, <laughs> one thing to keep in mind when in when machining half your cost if not all of your cost is setup time if you're making one part uh, so sometimes it's as cheap to make five as it is to one so I would argue that at making five you still may want to say hey uh, let's do a tolerance analysis uh, to see how tight or loose your fit really needs to be um, and then also looking at the tolerance analysis at your different temperatures. So, you know, you've got your assembly yeah, temperature yep. and then you've got your thermal expansion and you're gonna have some kind of gradient, I would assume, temperature yes. gradient from the low side of the pencil to the upside because yep. these pencils do get stuck. And when they get stuck, yep. that's a problem, right? Yep. Big yep. Problem. Yeah, so. the, the, the pencil is the part that experiences the highest temperature gradient out of anything because on one side is cryogenic oxygen, the other side is yeah. the combustion chamber. So yeah, it's definitely something yep. that- and you know it might be something as simple as, and this is where I'm, I'm guessing uh, with my I don't have experience in this area, right? I'm talking outside of my area of expertise here, but you know I would think that from a safety perspective, that if you started to get to something that was overly hot and you wanted the pintel to shut down, uh, then you might, you know, you might argue that you need a different alloy of stainless steel um, in the pintel to. Uh, to maybe expand and shut off if it got too hot. So it just like self shuts itself off oh, or something like this. That's uh, a good Or, or so put like some other, yeah, or, or something else. Okay. Again, I don't know. That may be an incredibly bad idea uh, that would lead to some other danger. Um, and, and while you guys are being safe, you're a hundred feet away, whatever else, you know, certainly still don't want to blow up our hardware on, yeah. on a, on a budget that you guys have. I assume that you're going to have, yeah, you don't want to blow up your investment. So, uh, but anyway, uh, be thinking of some things like those and, and be careful of overthinking things. Uh, cause you can certainly design yourself into failure pretty quickly because you try to manage a risk that may not exist. Okay. Um, but anyway, so the tolerance analysis stuff, I would say, yes, definitely do it. Find out under what conditions, uh, even in terms of stainless steel, you have your tolerance beam, but when you have two materials rubbing up against one another, uh, they can gall, uh, which is, you know, they kind of scrape. And maybe after, you know, the first couple of runs, maybe it's fine, but it's starting to scrape the metal in such a way that it begins to bind. 
Um, so you, you may need to find a coating or a material that, you know, maybe stainless and stainless might work okay. But if you're using a copper, that copper is going to golf probably for sure. Maybe you need to go to a certain copper alloy that's not going to gall when it rubs up against stainless steel. Um, that I'm galling will- kind of off the top of my head would uh, just a PTFE gasket. Um, like that. What, whatever you use. I, just okay. my main point here is that, you know, if you've got metal to metal that's going to be rubbing or vibrating up against mm -hmm. one another, we see this in aircraft, um, you know, and a lot of things where, yeah, things can start binding just because they've, they've been rubbed up against each other one too many times. Okay. Um, you know, for, for some of our connectors that, that we've looked at for different laptops and stuff like this, uh, you know, gold, uh, while gold can be very slick, a particular gold alloy actually is a, has a very, uh, like a natural lubricity. Um, rhodium is another very good electrical contact. Rhodium plating, uh, when rubbed up against another rhodium plating, uh, does not gall. It wears very well and it has a nice cosmetic look, et cetera. So key things is that there's other metals and metallurgies out there. It's called tribology. So if you need to do other research, when looking at parts that are going to be rubbing up against one another, research the term tribology, T-R-I-B-O-L-O-G-Y. Okay. And, uh, and you might find something there. So that's just something to think about. Uh, let's see, go to 14. Emmett, did you want to say something? I saw you trying to talk. Uh, yeah, I just don't think that copper and stainless will be a problem connecting to each other because they have such different crystalline structures. But um, but yeah, stainless and stainless might be a slight issue. If, yeah, if 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 you can, if if you, because I heard the word think, and that's fine. I'm glad you're thinking. Uh, uh, go, not, somebody's already it. studied it. Go go find out and make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Then on the 14 side. Uh, okay. So here. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that I understand everything that's here and what the pressures are, wherever yeah. they are, but I see a lot of valves, right? A lot of mechanical things. Yes. Um, I see a couple of purge protectors and yeah, burst discs. That's good. Burst disc. Uh, I'll let somebody else decide if those are the right locations for them, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But in the end, uh, the quality of this, you can have the highest quality parts, but in the end, uh, you know, you're going to be running this thing. How are you going to detect leaks, right? It's been assembled. It gets transported. You know, it's moved from one garage to another. Then it's out to the test site. It's left there for a little while. Um, or, you know, I just want to make sure you guys are thinking about how you're going to do a leak test, whether you pressurize it with air, you're looking for, and then you spray it down with soapy water, you're looking for bubbles, uh, or if you inject it with colored water that, you know, uh, after left, you know, you do a, a leak down test with water over a 24 hour or 72 hour period. Okay. And then uh, you see how much, you know, uh, uh, pressures leak down, okay. uh, see if there's any colorant somewhere, whatever. There's strategies okay. for that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Then we, we, we actually have to, we plan to have an extensive water testing campaign, but that's the leak testing is not something that we've thought of yet. So, well, yeah. and, and yeah. So, and the other thing too, is that depending on what fluid you choose for these, uh, water may not be the best. I mean, water certainly is readily available. Uh, you know, you are looking at using kerosenes. You don't want kerosene and water mixing together. Yep. I would assume things like this. Yeah. So, and the entire liquid oxygen side needs to be, you know, oxygen cleaned before we put anything in it. Or yeah. before we put oxygen in. But. Okay, so yeah, as long as you're aware of something there, I, I would assume that the, I don't know if the, on one of those slides you talked about some kind of safety organization, amateur rocketry or something like yes. that. I'm pretty sure if, if, have you guys talked with anybody over there yet in that club? Uh, we have not had a chance. They're kind of like this blanket, or, oh yeah. They're kind of a what? They're kind of like a blanket organization. I have yeah. not. They, they host tests. I, yes. I'm not too familiar with them. Well, uh, my, the, the, the key thing is I know, uh, and they should, if they haven't already done it, they should be doing it here, I would think, soon. I know they got into the desert. Uh, I don't remember if it's Black Rock or if it's somewhere north of there, and they do a bunch of uh, rocket launches, right? And they'll do the mm -hmm. big, you know, sounding rocket launches, and they mm -hmm. make, you know, they get up there to, you know, Mach 3 or whatever it is mm -hmm. with their sounding rockets. Um, I'm sure people there have worked with liquid fuel rockets. Yes. I'm sure if you take some of these questions and you say, hey, here are some things that, you know, we don't know how we do it. Back to the welding, the guy might, oh yeah, I weld these things all the time, 155 PSI, that's a no brainer, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of these concerns that you have, I might have um, for these guys, they've been through it enough times that you can rely on their experience to get you guys through. Okay. Um, so I, I'd really, I'd really 
find out when their events are, particularly if they're, you know, I know it's COVID and stuff like that, but if there's, there, if there's any serious events that they're doing that are kind of open uh, uh, showcases for them, uh, by all means, hop in a van uh, safely, six feet apart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And yeah. get up there and, and, and get your network. Okay. Um, we likely okay. have access to a bunch of other rocket um, collegiate rocket teams that have test fired engines. Yeah. Uh, and we've had some conversations, but we definitely want to look for more of the established groups as well. Thank you. Yep. Yep. I figured that you've, you've probably been talking with the USC guys. It looked like they had something that was uh, uh, pretty good going there. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll go to slide 15. Okay. Uh, okay. So slide 15. Here I've just got. Uh, Again, looking at these tanks, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got all this fuel, I've got all this, all this oxidizer, and again, you're you're intending to run, was it for 230 seconds? Did I interpret that correctly? Uh, In our, seconds. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that one's a weird number. That's actually yeah. a measure of efficiency. It's a measure of how fast yeah. your exhaust is leaving. The yeah, maximum right. burn time is about 30 seconds. About 30 seconds, okay. But, we, but so the first for, tests are going to be much shorter. So for 30 seconds, so up to 30 seconds, yes. uh, how much fuel are you guys planning on have? How much oxidizer in, in gallons or something are you mm -hmm. going to have and or in burn volume? And how many gallons of, of kerosene are you going to have? So the uh, engine mass flow rate is 0 0.5 kilograms per second. For 30 seconds, that turns out to about six liters of fuel and 10 liters of liquid oxygen. Okay. Um, so when you have up to 10 liters of oxygen, if that leaks down pretty quickly or something like that, uh, anybody know like quantitatively how explosive that can be? I mean, is right. this, is this yeah. equivalent to a thousand pound bomb? Is this equivalent to just, you know, 150 PSI in a two liter bottle? Yeah, oh, we haven't done those studies yet. Yeah. We, we do have to. We're, we're planning on doing TNT equivalency for basically what happens if all of the propellant on site combusts or like explodes at the normal pressure. What does that look like? What's the equivalent TNT there? Kind of base, yeah. base on. Okay. So yeah, so my only comment here was just, you can already made it. It's like, you know, you're only going to be doing probably like a, a, you know, a one second blip, a two second blip, maybe a five second blip, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, <laughs> and then having so much fun, you just do that for the next five days or something like that, right? 24 hours a day, you just keep hitting it off. Okay. Uh, uh, then I would assume that uh, some of the testing duration is probably going to be based on getting the rocket higher and higher temperatures, right? So when you first blast it off, it's going from ambient temperature temperature to, uh, uh, you know, some of the components may not reach their full potential yet after a 30 second run. Mm -hmm. So uh, I assume that you're, you'd be pacing yourselves based upon the temperature of your, uh, or the temperature profile perhaps within the rocket. Um, yeah. So anyway, just, yeah, I'd be thinking about how you're going to manage the fuels, I guess, to, to reduce the, uh, the amount of stored energy there. Because okay. I, I, I know there's some stories certainly within uh, scaled composites that go mm -hmm. way oh, back yes. Yes. when they were doing pressure vessels and stuff like that. And they had a big lesson. Um, nobody was hurt, but they had a big late lesson on stored energy in a cockpit. It was a pressurized cockpit. It was the first one they ever designed. They pressure tested it with air. Uh, and when it ruptured, <laughs> it went everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, the neighbors are calling and stuff like that. So they use water from then on. So anyway, so just monitor those uh, stored okay. energies. Stored energy. Uh, 16. Stored energy. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. On the control system. So now this is exciting, right? Because this is something that... Uh, uh, that that none of us, well, at least on the mechanical side, none of us know a whole lot about, uh, but we suffer the consequences of a lot, and that's software. Um, and what I mean by this is that uh, I don't know how complicated the code is going to be, but I'd, I'd like to uh, have you guys figure out how you're actually going to put the software through its paces for bugs. Uh, oh, actually, Joseph can, can talk yeah. about it. Uh, yeah. The Rust compiler has built-in support for unit testing and makes it very easy to write those. Well, when so, you say when you say unit testing, what does that mean? Uh, that's you isolate like the smallest piece of code that you can, and you write a function that makes sure it works correctly. And yeah. that that's it. You just do that enough, and hopefully, you've verified that everything works as it should and yep. then verify that things work as they should together. 
Okay. Awesome. So that's that's all within the compiler, all within the computer. Uh, yes. And all and all based upon the inputs that you, I assume there's inputs that you put in there to say, okay, it can be values between here and here and everything works fine. Yes. Um, are you able to put it through a test where, like on thermocouples, I know you got thermocouples, you've got some pressure, uh, uh, pressure transducers probably here and there monitoring all this telemetry. Uh, those values can be very noisy. And I don't know how often you're going to be pulling from any of these, these values. Um, and so I'm kind of, you know, it's these kinds of bugs that I keep thinking of in terms of uh, uh, if something goes awry that's not within your your internal validation test plan or your virtual test plan um, can yield something which is quite surprising. Uh, but uh, uh, this that's an area that's well outside of my expertise, so I just kind of leave it there. Is just so that's the, the noisy inputs is definitely something that yeah. gets overlooked often. Although yeah. from the perspective of the whole system testing, we're actually taking it a step further, and we're developing an entire um, virtual environment in which we can run our controls code in a way that it thinks that it's running on the on the on the test stand. And, and that's. Actually, and that's fine, but it, it, it's still going to come back to whatever kind of test signal that you're going to provide the code. It needs to be a realistic code. Yes, so that, yeah. that, vir that virtual environment is, is, only, is only as good as it is to the real environment. Um, and, um, and again, not knowing how much passive safety or whatever else is in there, uh, you know, in this thing. Um, it's just one of those areas that it's just, that's the, I think the more repetitive and the more comfortable and the more paces you're able to put this thing through uh, the mm -hmm. software through the better. Okay. But yeah, you're, I'm, I'm glad you guys are on it. Uh, sounds like you're on it. So that's good. Uh, go to 17. Um, on this one, you talk about these handshakes. Uh, how long does it take to go through each handshake? We haven't really considered that yet. Okay. Because I, I, I mean, I assume you know one of the things, and I'm only trying to think with with what little I know of where I've heard issues or read articles or whatever else, and talk to other people about stuff here and there, and passive, you know, passing conversation, is uh, these handshakes. If they get delayed, and especially when they get delayed longer than what's expected, um, like you may expect the handshake to take place in let's say 500 milliseconds, um, but it takes 750 for some reason. Never has. Uh, but then that triggers some of the kind of domino effect downstream. I know you've got all these little checks here on your on your 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 slide here, but the reality is, is that if anything gets out of sync uh, within this within this handshake sequence, or mm -hmm. if if the readings from whatever sensors get out of sync, um, is it possible that you get to a point where nothing shuts down, uh, nothing's alerted to the user? And then something, you know, over temps, over pressurizes, or whatever else. So, something to keep in mind. So, uh, for the handshake, the handshakes only happen during non-critical stage tran transitions. Okay. So, once stuff starts burning, everything is handled on board. So, they're the only latency is going to be the latency of the sensors and the and the actuators. Yeah. Um, and the idea is to have redundant sensors to hopefully enable us to detect when something has gone wrong and hopefully figure out which one is right. Yeah. And if we can't determine that, we can just shut it off. Yep. I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment that Makar has probably heard from you before. Uh, as an engineer, and particularly as you, go, you guys go on in your engineering career, anytime you hear an engineer say hope, that's where you want to put your focus. Yeah. So I heard you say hope. So you want to put your focus there, uh, because in the end, hope's not going to make this rocket burn. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, and I do know at least when I've worked with safety circuits and safety equipment within assembly equipment or whatever else on our, on our manufacturing floors mm -hmm. at Intel, um, they tend to be very very safe. And that means that they will fault more often. So there's going to be a lot of false. Uh, let me see. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, false. Better to have false positives than nothing. Yeah, at all. false positives. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the uh, uh, or true negatives. Anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so but this is good. I, I like where your thinking's at. This is uh, this is all nice. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to see later on, because uh, I assume it's probably not been worked out yet, but uh, the abort sequence. Uh, so I see your abort lines here. I see your yes. hard failure. I'd like to understand 
Um, uh, once you have it worked out, certainly the details on your uh, plumbing and everything like that, if, what's actually starting shutting down, yes. what are you, you know, are you shutting down the fuel first, you're shutting down the oxidizer first, stuff like that. Yeah. So that's good. Uh, let's go to slide 18. 18, yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, I see here. Okay. So we got pressure transducers. We got the thermal. Um, this was just more of a question in terms of your acquisition timing uh, and how you guys are going to handle the abundance of data that you collect. Because uh, you're going to have all these questions. You're going to have maybe certain answers that you're going to get from simulations, and then you're going to want to validate some of these simulations, you know, thermally and pressure-wise. And you're going to be interested about gradients. And is the thermal gradient from this point to the other point really linear, or is it yep. more exponential, or whatever it is? And so be thinking not so much in terms of yet yeah, you're going to have lots of these really be thinking about also how much of that you can handle and how often you can take those uh, those readings. Um, and Makar can probably share his experiences because we can take all kinds of readings temperature wise, even onto very simple, you know, objects such as a, you know, a compute device or something like this. But going off and trying to handle all that data can become very daunting, especially if you're going through test after test after test after test. Um, so just, just be mindful of that as you guys go through your, your uh, instrumentation plan for your rocket. Um, you know, it's, it's that trying to find that balance of, it's always better to have more data than you need, but then, you know, you, it's almost like also trying to drink water from a fire hydrant. Um, it'll overwhelm you. Um, okay, slide 19. Okay, slide 19. I got a lot of scribbles on this slide, um, but I think I think there were just more mental notes. So I, uh, it's good. I like the fact that you're you're utilizing uh, some existing uh, safety stuff from you know rocket you know safety hazard lists whatever. This is this is good. Don't let it be the bible. This is where you know your engagement with the other universities as well as that the uh, uh, the you know the rocketry clubs and stuff like this is going to be of uh, great value. You'll understand, uh, you'll get an idea more about what this kind of stuff means and being implemented in the real world. Uh, let's see, I see, let's see water testing. And then I've got a question, see how. Ah, so as you go through this testing, uh, one thing that I would argue is that anytime we go through testing, you're stressing the rocket. Your, or your, your stressing your structures, even your test structures mm -hmm. and stuff. Be mindful that you may be fatiguing some of your components. Okay. Um, so just because they're rated to a particular value or something like that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be rated to that, you know, over a hundred cycles. Um, uh, example might be is that as you're going through, particularly if you've got this pintle operation, uh, if your pintle moves in and out smoothly, I mean, it's probably fine, but maybe if your pintle uh, pulses uh, and it, you know, and it's it's got a vibration or something like that, and it's sending water a, hammer, or like something. A, yeah, like a water hammer or whatever it is, uh, you may be fatiguing something that will, uh, uh, you know, do something. The classic example you've probably covered it in class already, um, at least for those that have graduated, uh, is the idea of taking your air compressor and running PVC line. Um, as a uh, as a conduit for for pressure to somewhere else and uh, everything's fine but that PVC at some point will fracture um, and uh, even within your scuba tanks right those things are rated up to all kinds of uh, 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 high pressures you know 3,000 psi or whatever they are but if there's a manufacturing defect or a crack inside that pressure vessel uh, it will rupture and depending on the type of aluminum uh, or materials you have within your devices, uh, that crack propagation can either run away or it will just stretch, break, and leak, and everything will just leak down. Mm -hmm. So, be, yeah. uh, I don't know if anybody, yeah, I, anybody I your time taking fatigue. some rupture um, resistance materials, and I'm just keeping an eye on it yeah. for all the materials we're using. Yeah. And, 
and my feeling is, my sense is, again, when working with, again, the other colleges, uh, these other rocketry clubs, uh, if you ask, hey, what are you guys using for here? They, a lot of them might just go, I'm just using electrical conduit or whatever it is, and it seems to work fine. I mean, if if they have experience and it's known to be safe, then it's fine. Uh, but because uh, 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 I know when I use the scuba diving, the, the scuba tank example, I mean, we're talking pressures that are uh, 30 times higher than what your rocket chamber is actually going to exhibit. So, uh, definitely be mindful of fatigue and, it, and not even just metal it, fatigue, other fatigues as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just in terms of a real world exercise, I mean, it's there. And that's this is where if anybody has had experience with uh, actual fatigue analysis or crack propagation, um, but. Uh, um, uh, in terms of your your the pressures that you need to have in your oxidation tank and your um, your kerosene tank, what kind of pressures do you have to have there to be able to drive the fuel into the chamber? Do you know? So we have some estimates uh, so far. Uh, we know specific pressure drops over some components, but um, we know that they have to be. We know that the injector, for example, has to have approximately a twenty percent pressure drop. Um, we don't know exactly what the pressure drop is going to be over the cooling jacket yet. We expect the pressures to be something like 15 bar, not probably not exceeding. How, how are those pressures going to be driven? Are you relying yeah. just on pressurizing the tanks or do you have a pump that you're, you intend to use? Okay, so there's a few different ways to pressurize a rocket like this. And the, one, uh, the first one is the blowdown method, right? So you just put in the, the, the pressure gas and then, you know, the pressure decays. Uh, what we're doing is we're continuously replacing the uh, the spent volume with helium from a standard K bottle. Uh, ah, that's right. Yep, yeah, and that's where the regulators come in. Uh, but you're still going to have a pressure drop across that helium, uh, and you're also going to have a cost to that helium because you're not going to be able to recover that helium. Yes, we're not. Um, uh, we can also we're actually considering nitrogen as well, but it's just a standard gas somewhere, and that's what's driving the, the, the pressure. Yep, no, nope, I understand. Um, it would be interesting as you guys go through it to find out how much helium you're using. Um, I, I assume it wouldn't be much. It's probably not that big of a deal. Um, okay, uh, go to slide 21. Um, oh, I think we've already discussed this one. We see regenerative cooling, preheat externally. Um, yeah, weight savings. Okay, yep, those were all my comments. Thank you so much. Yeah. That, was, that was actually really, really in depth. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you what so was much. what was the name of the uh, the uh, middle material between your um, small pressure vessel and like the outside that you're talking about? The uh, like X wave uh, thing. Uh, uh, yeah, you know it's uh, so with the experience that I've had, that I've had, it's think of something that looks like a screen, like a like a mosquito mesh. Right, it, it actually, but it's a wire mesh. It's usually it's made out of copper. Um, in our case, it's been made out of copper. Um, it can be made out of any material. Uh, but what's important is that everywhere one of these these threads crosses, you know, I mean, imagine laying down like a bunch of aluminum wire or copper wire. Let's just say example copper wire. So lay a crisscross hatch, 90 degree crisscross hatch, of copper wire. Everywhere that the copper wire passes there is a bulge of some sort. Um, there's a better, I, I, I'm at a loss in terms of- I was of, just hoping that there was a, a name for it because no, just for my own research, I don't think we should try and do something like that for this. No, it would be, no, you'd, you'd be able to find stuff on there. In fact, if you've ever seen like expanded metal, uh, like the, when I, yeah, expanded metal, you guys familiar with what expanded metal is? This is the, um, like a diamond shaped, grid it's a metal grid you'll see on some trucks it's not the diamond plate but this is like a they put okay, a bunch like of a grill slit, protection they, or something yeah no they, they put a bunch of slits in the metal and then they stretch it out i can probably send you guys a link yeah. uh but it's it's something like that where you can probably find some kind of material that you can just lay down uh in between the wall and the uh and the pressure vessel uh how it would be attached or you know i would assume it would probably be some kind of press fit so it'd probably be something where if you you did put a screen this this uh this spacer layer of material in between um you would probably heat the nozzle cool the regenerative inside 
and uh, so you had your expansion and then slip the thing in and and then as everything come to temperature it would press fit I would that's how I would do it for room temperature I don't know how well that would work once you got it up to temperature under operation I would assume the pressure of the of the nozzle itself would push the the inner wall out yeah and it would hold everything tight but yeah. Um, but yeah. there's a lot of, I don't know what the fuel rate would, you know, how, what's the velocity of that fluid flow through that regenerative cooling channel? I don't know what, I don't have a sense on what that would be. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what kind of viscous forces you'd be dealing with to be yeah, it's pushing actually, around there. It's actually pretty high, yeah. The cooling efficiency uh, basically increases with Reynolds number uh, because it's a force convection thing. And, but the faster you move it, the better it cools, but also the more irreversible friction losses that you have. Yeah. So it's, it's a really weird balancing act and we're still trying to, we're building a unified model for that right now. But, but I definitely see what you're saying about the, the press fit due to temperature difference. And we could actually yeah. probably do an analysis at operating temps as well. I, and this is, and this is where, you know, when, unless you have somebody that already has some design rules for you guys, this is where that particular regenerative function and this, you know, vision of, of this rocket might need to get pulled out. I mean, it might just be easier just to pull that out so that everybody can focus on all the other issues that you're going to be working on. Even though it's a really cool part of what's going on, um, it's, it may not deliver the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, oh, yeah, and, it's definitely conceptually the most difficult to model. Yeah, and, and it's always something, you know, and again, this is just where in order to do it, you'd have to get design rules from somebody. And the question would be is, are the other universities doing this regenerative cooling rocket? Yeah, some of them are, yeah. Some of them are. Ah, yeah. isn't that and that disappointing? Uh, how many how many ro how many rockets have they built in the past? And what, their first rocket did it have it right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's actually one of the, the the other university basically told us the same thing. Like, guys, this is your first engine. <laughs> Just yeah. do a heat sink <laughs> engine. Uh, but yeah, okay. Uh, th yeah, Good. definitely. Thank you for your feedback. Yep. Uh, and, and I'll be honest, so from the program management side, uh, as if, if I was a program, if I was actually a program manager working on this, this is probably one of the features where it doesn't buy you anything in terms of your stated goals. It doesn't get you close to those stated goals, right? There's simpler ways that you could achieve those stated goals. You don't have to worry about the weight. You don't have to worry about the efficiency. Just get the rocket to make sound and thrust. So from a program management standpoint, cost management, the whole thing, I'd say throw out the regenerative thing. Um, but that's your call. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, on some of the other things, uh, I mean, it looks like, yeah, looks like, yeah. You know, it's my first pass, uh, feedback to you guys so well thank you it's been very helpful actually yeah. good i think i think yeah we, we speak for everyone we've, we've, we've really enjoyed this uh so to, to, yeah so to give you an idea so when i when i was in college uh junior and senior year i was part of a rocket club the fact that all of you guys are here uh, uh says a lot so that's good uh i commend you on that because uh, it's, uh, uh, what my recollection was is that, you know, only a handful of people actually showed up or put anything in uh, effort into it. Uh, and our, our objective was just to take, I think it was a class G or a class O engine. I can't remember which one we had settled on, but it was a rather sizable, uh, just model rocket. And we were just going to build a carbon tube. In fact, we already had the carbon tube because it was cut out from the spar of a, of a, of a, a man-powered helicopter that Cal Poly was building, <laughs> it never flew. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> so my so my point to you is that we already had stuff built. We already had this. We just kind of all had to put it together, and uh, uh, and it, it never come together over the course of uh, of ten years. And and I can remember one guy wanted me to do a vibrations analysis on the rocket, and I was like, okay, well, you know, what kind of uh, forcing functions do we have? And he says, ah, the Saturn V has like 800 hertz. I don't remember what it was. It was some kind of, he just threw out a number. And I said, that's a Saturn V rocket. <laughs> this is just a model <laughs> rocket. This doesn't make any sense. And that guy was going, getting his master's degree. I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was a sophomore, I think. And I was just yeah. like, this doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so point is, is that uh, be careful what you bite off. Be careful what you chew on. Make sure that you, whatever you pick, it's something that you can make some forward progress on. And trust me, getting something that just lights off for 30 seconds, that you can, you can do it all the time. It's reliable. It's fun. Uh, you can roast hot dogs on it because, uh, you know, it feels so safe or whatever else. We'll make a robot for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'll have a lot more, I think, uh, you'll get a lot more out of the project. 
than you will if you try and take off uh, additional complexity. So just, just be thinking about all that. All right. Uh, I think I'd also like to take the time, like now that you bring it up, uh, I'm really proud of the team so far. I mean, we came together like three months, basically made organization from scratch, implemented like three different revisions of our own project management system. And then we're here presenting, you know, conceptual design in the middle of summer. So I, I'm really grateful and, for everyone here. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think it, it, just the fact that everybody's here uh, shows a lot that all that's happening on in the background. Uh, and then my final piece of advice, again, in terms of how to build things, whatever else, I tried to make a set of shelves for the, uh, you know, as an engineer, whatever else, you know, all kinds of high precision uh, analysis design, whatever else, I go and try and build a, a set of shelves in a house, nothing square, uh, <laughs> it, everything barely fits. Um, but they're good looking shelves, but I tell you what, uh, it's, it takes uh, probably 300% more time uh, when you're working with everybody's, uh, somebody else's quality. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. my time scales are definitely very, very, let's say optimistic and yeah. I push pretty hard on them, but yeah. yeah. All right, well, cool. Thanks so much. Thank uh, you so yeah. much. You're Thank welcome. You. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, have a good night guys. Just, you too. You too. Good night.